<coughs> yeah. So it's the uh, sort of final um, day. We want to try to just look back and see actually what we did do this semester. Um, so I'm going to try to be keep all details more or less away and just to, tr to pick up the big lines in the course. Um, and in the end, I will uh, talk a little bit about the examination and the, um, the um, sort of uh, grading principles, if you might say so. Um, yeah, so you, s you will find on Fronter the, the material. So the course was more or less uh, completely restructured f uh, starting from the, the fall 2013 semester. So much of the sort of previous exams that I have are are not that relevant actually. So, and what is relevant is more or less taken into the compendium. But we now have at least the December 2013 and a continuation exam from June 2014. So these are exams. And I mean, this year's exam will be f in in scope and amount of work and so on will be fairly similar to these two ones, right? Um, if I should judge them, I think this one is a little bit more difficult, maybe at least um, at least to get the top score. This one would m maybe be a little bit more difficult. And then there is a note for exam preparation. I don't exactly remember what I call that note, but uh, you will find it in this exam preparation folder. Um, so it lists. Uh, fairly large set of possible questions which out of which I will surely pick some of them. Yeah. And it's explained in this note more more precisely. Um, yeah. So and also this will be the last class. I, I don't want to sort of stand here and go through any of these exam sets, but I urge you to work on the problems and just uh, get to my office or talk to Vladimir if you have any, yeah? Uh, the note is uh, the solution uh, attached to the document too, or just the... Uh, um, uh, this, there are solutions for these exams also. For the notes? No, no, not really. Oh. So there, are, you can take the, the notes, look at the questions, talk to other students, discuss, ask me whatever, but I haven't sort of prepared a list of answers to it uh, as it is. Um, yeah. So that's the thing. If you have specific questions and so on, you have the solutions, but you can also talk to me or to Vladimir about it. Okay, so let's just dive into this and see what we some fairly have done. Um, we started sometime in late August or maybe, yeah, probably late August with lecture one, um, which is foundations for the course actually, most of which would be known from before. It's about descriptive statistics, about random variables, distributions, the normal distribution and some basic statistical inference. Uh, so we'll, we'll look into those a little bit. Um, so we talked about data and that we have in a data set we have variables. We are used to this now using SPSS as our main tool. 
and we looked at uh, some distinctions between types of variables. Uh, so we had the numerical variables, which could be discrete or continuous. Typically, the continuous would be something measured on a continuous scale, of course. And there were categorical <coughs> variables, which we distinguished between um, nominal variables and ordinal variables. So the ordinal variables had some some natural ordering, while the nominal would be just colors or something that you cannot really order in any meaningful way. Yeah. So, and you re remember and you realize that this distinction here between discrete and continuous um, will not, it's difficult to make it exact mathematically uh, the way we use it. So, we say the discrete has distinct values and the continuous can be anywhere on a scale. But if we deal with a data set and one of the variables is the price of a used car, you might argue that, OK, it can only be in integer Norwegian kroner, which is, in a sense, discrete. But we would uh, typically tre treat that variable as a continuous variable in the analysis. So there were data. Um, and descriptive statistics, it deals with two issues. One is to summarize data with the key numbers. Um, and then we talk about central tendency, which is typically either the mean or the median. And you should know the difference and the similarities uh, of these. When typically would they be similar and when could they typically be different? Right. So there is something with a very skewed distribution. Then typically the median uh, might give a better description of the typical behavior. So there is sort of central tendency. This measures somehow where is the typical value, what is the typical central value of the data set. And then there is measures of variation. And the far most common one is uh, to talk about standard deviation or, well, which is derived directly from variance. But it's the standard deviation that we can interpret in a natural way in the data. And then there were some alternative measures for variation also. Uh, for instance, the interquartile range. We discussed a little bit. So commonly we use the standard deviation, but you should recall that it's in similarity to the mean, it's also uh, sensitive to extreme values. So for instance, we have this, this very important and basic uh, rule of thumb here that <laughs> says if you have some symmetric, nice, almost or similar to normal distribution of your data, so if you can assume some fairly nice distribution like this. And you take the, OK, these are, you can talk about the theoretical mean if we are a little bit ahead of ourselves, and the sigma. Then the interval mu plus minus 2 sigma would contain approximately 95% of the observations. So it's something like 95% probability of being between mu and plus to minus 2 sigma. And in normal situations, we might not know the theoretical parameters. But if we have sufficient amount of data, we would estimate um, the 
mu with x bar and the sigma with s. And then we would say approximately the same is true if I put x bar here plus minus 2s. So this is OK, but you could have trouble here if you do this for um, If you have data with extreme values, then this s will be way too large. So it's not more a good approximation to use. Right. Yeah. So this one, I hope you will remember for the rest of your life. If someone tells you this is the mean, this is the standard deviation of my data, and I don't have extreme observations then immediately you see x bar plus minus 2 is, is a good 95% interval. Yeah. Then we talked, of course, about one very important concept, the correlation, the sample correlation. It's closely related to the scatter plots. So we look at linear dependencies, and we measure it with a sample correlation. So in this picture, you see a sample correlation that is about 0 0.74. Yeah. So this is the sort of first part of descriptive statistics is summarizing the data, pulling out some key numbers. And here are the most important, along with the, the sample correlation. And this, of course, this was early in the semester, but this points to the end of the semester where we did regression analysis to sort of utilize correlation in, in forecasting, for instance. So this is just descriptive, but we also y utilize it uh, later on. Yeah. OK. And the second part of descriptive statistics is about okay. graphics. Making charts, tables, pictures to visualize more or less complicated uh, properties of the data. And there were different types of them. So, and we, we sort of split between what we would like to do for continuous variables and for categorical variables. Um, yeah. So, you probably I remember these things. Uh, scatter plots where you have two variables. Histogram, where you have your data, you put your x observations on the line here, and then based on some fixed size intervals, you count how many points appear in each of these intervals. And then you make a bar with height corresponding to that. So something like that. And it gives you some fair idea about how the probability distribution for this data might look. Right. That's a histogram. So for categorical variables, we did talk about frequency tables, which is nothing more than just uh, if you have a, a categorical variable that can have the values A, B, and C, then a frequency table is just counting how many of the observations were in each um, category. And if you like, you could have percentages and so on. 
Um, and along with that, it will be very natural to produce either a pie chart or a bar chart. So a pie would be um, a b. Ah, okay, the, the size is not true here. So something like this. Or a bar chart with uh, just columns showing the relative height corresponding to these figures. And we did something about cross tabulations where you have two categorical variables and you classify them according to the one and the second simul simultaneously, and then you just put in a table how many A, B, C did you have in group one or two. Suppose you have two groups of students who all get grades A, B, C. Then something like this. That's a cross tabulation. And you might make percentages of all kinds in here. And yeah, we have seen various ways of visualizing this also. So. This is where we started. This was even before SPSS, or before we talked about SPSS. But we just discussed the ideas here. And then we later saw how to do all of this with the SPSS. OK. Um, so still being in the fundamental business, we talked about um, random variables. Um, so they are quantities describing anything that is modeled as uncertain. And we typically use an uppercase letter for them. Um, and they can be, uh, you have more or less the same distinction as we had with the data, which is naturally because if you have a data set, it typically is a list of observed values for a random variable. So you get the same kind of classification. Discrete, continuous, categorical, nominal. So we've been through all that. No need to be very detailed about this now. Um, and you remember the probability distribution for a random variable needs to be described in a very different way, depending on whether it's discrete or continuous. Uh, so that's a basic issue, and it's not really, well, this is not a point that has been uh, of any importance during the course. But it's also, of course, good to know it. So still talking about random variables, often abbreviated RVs, random variables. Um, we needed to discuss uh, theoretically the expected value, the mean, and the theoretical standard deviation. And um, these are sort of the parameters that we estimate when we do statistics, the basic statistics. We take a sample. We look at some variable here. And then we estimate what we call a par parameter in the population, for instance, mu, a mean, which is then the expected value of some variable. So the idea is very intuitively that if you observe this variable many times and you label the observations like this, 
this is what you have in your SPSS file observations of a random variable so you take this and you compute the x bar then the more data you have the closer this will be to the theoretically true mean and also we can compute the sample standard deviation which we call SX and it will approach the Sigma so you come to what we did in the first lecture about very basic parameter estimation And then there was a little uh, session with a normal distribution, which is, there's no way you can have a statistic course without uh, turning or running into the normal distribution somewhere. So it's very important, it's fundamentally important. And we need to know about that. And we do now, I hope, uh, everything that we need to know. So. We know that there are infinitely many different normal distributions with given mean and sigma. But regardless of mu and so this would be sigma then. Recall up to here is two sigmas. So between here and here should be something like 95 percent again um, so regardless of mu and Sigma we can just <coughs> take the X and any question about X what's the probability that X is less than this or between this and that we we compute this by standardization so we take the same question and we just look at the variable X minus mu over sigma we call it set and it will be a standard normal this variable right so any any question about any normal distribution can be answered by looking at at uh, standard normal so that's why we need only one single table for doing search calculations and that's why you're gonna have one single table in the exam it's in the compendium there is just one single table and that's the standard normal so every question that we have had would be possible to answer from that so normally in a statistics course you might have had a more a few more tables for instance for T distributions briefly back to that later but um, it's a consequence of the choice to try to keep it as simple as possible not making it a course about looking at different tables and so on but trying to understand the, the basics yep. Okay, so that's normal distribution. We usually, as you see in the previous exams, there are usually a few warm-up questions maybe about the normal distributions just to get started. Um, and there might be this year also, or maybe not. Um, yeah. So, um, in the end of lecture one more or less we talked a little bit about inference and inference is more or less this process here you have some unknown parameters and we want to estimate them we use the some proper estimates from the population or from a sample and then the question is simply uh, how close are we coming when we estimate, for instance, mu with the x-bar? 
So this is one part of inference when we talk about confidence intervals. The other part is usually hypothesis testing. So some statement about mu, and then use sample information to decide between the, the null and the alternative hypothesis. Uh, yeah, so in the basic statistics uh, division, we find the confidence interval for mu with this formula here, where this set alpha half is, um, of course, the cutoff point from the standard normal distribution. So we have drawn this picture a few times this semester. This point set alpha half cuts off probability alpha half in the standard normal distribution. And that gives you what we call 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. So almost always alpha is 0 0.05. And then we get a 95% confidence interval. OK. And there was a little issue. OK, this is OK with, with uh, when the sample size is not too small. If the sample size uh, grows beyond or comes below, say, 30, we need to modify this formula a little bit using the t distributions. So this is estimating the mu, basic confidence interval for mu. Then we did something similar when we want to estimate a proportion in the population. So we have this formula that we probably remember. And once again, there were some requirements that the sample should not be too small here. Uh, something like n times p hat times 1 minus p hat more than 5 or something, yeah. So something like that. Okay. And then we had to start uh, the practical side of the course with SPSS. So that was lecture two, more or less. And I guess from this lecture, there cannot be very many questions in the exam because it's, yeah, it's technical using SPSS mainly. So uh, it's about managing data, how you select subset, how you split the data set how you define variables and, and so on. And it was about providing some of these descriptive statistics that I discussed using SPSS. So uh, I think I wrote in this note a little bit the, the few questions that might be asked in this from this lecture. But I'm definitely not going to ask, like, which menu do you have to use if you want to produce a scatter plot in SPSS like that. So, Then we started on and sort of moving a bit further with the theory. We were doing the second part of inference, which is uh, testing of hypothesis. Um, so certainly I'm not going to go into that too much now. But um, 
are sort of two issues here. The one is that the general setup of a hypothesis test, which involves these all of these concepts here. So you should ideally be able to explain some of this. Um, so what is the p-value, for instance, in a particular setting, and so on. Um, So this could be somewhat complicated, maybe, but uh, you have the compendium and stuff on the XM also, so we'll see. It, it'll be okay. So I don't really want to uh, sort of mess myself into details here because then, uh, then I'm going to start talking too long. But I just want to show you that this was the foundations of the hypothesis testing. So if you're sort of completely blank on this question, for instance, what the hell does he mean by this? Sorry, pardon my language. Uh, then you might want to have to check a little bit in the compendium or in the notes, right? If you have no idea at this point what is a type 1 error, then this suggests that you should read a little bit, right? And so th that's the theoretical part. Then we went sort of a bit more practical and looked at some specific tests. Um, so the one sample T test, for instance, is we considered it mainly when we had large samples. And it's about something like uh, population mean. For instance, this. And you recall the test statistic would be looking at the sample mean minus this value divided by the sample standard deviation and the square root of n. And then the important thing was this null distribution. Which was, OK, standard normal because of this. Alternatively, if you like, you could use a t distribution. Um, then there was something called a binomial test for proportions. That would be about the uh, proportion. Uh, so the null hypothesis would say something like p equals 0 0.9. And the alternative would be either one-sided or two-sided, saying that, OK, p is less than 0 0.9. It's a one-sided. And a simple test statistic again well, would be you take the sample proportion minus this value divided by square root of, OK, you insert this 0 0.9 here. this and again it's null distribution so assuming a zero is true you can use a standard normal distribution to compute the p-value for this yeah and then we did a little bit with this two sample t-test where you compare two population means, so it, the null hypothesis is very often like this, saying that the population means are equal, and the alternative, say two-sided, it would say that no, they're not equal, they are in fact different. 
And how do we choose between those two? Well, we look at the test statistic again, which is simply difference of sample means and then um, scaled by something like this. Remember this? It's not coming as a shock, I hope. <laughs> yeah. And again, with so deliberately, we stayed with the fairly large samples here because when we don't do that, we run into s more technical problems, which are not really that interesting. So if you want to use statistics later and you come to a situation where you have small samples, you need to be careful. But for this course, we try to draw the big lines without drowning in detail. So with this assumption, we could still use our good friend, the standard normal distribution here, to find the p-values and so on. And yeah, we talked a little bit about small sample t test where you need to modify uh, this. But okay, you, it's okay if you know the fact that you need to resort to t distributions. If n is smaller than 30. And that goes also here. If one of these samples are smaller than 30, you need to replace this standard normal with a t distribution. But I never showed you a t table and so on, so it's not going to be in the exam any tests of this kind where you actually need to use a t distribution. But you might know this fact. Yeah, and in the end, we we didn't go very detailed here either. We just discussed this issue that you sometimes have a data set. Um, okay, yeah, right. And it might be important to to check whether this data could possibly come from a normal distribution or not. And that's what I mean by test of normality. It's in the end of lecture three or chapter three. And we never put up a test statistic for it, but we looked at this normal probability plot, which means we make on this axis, so here are my x data, which I wonder are normal or not. So I make here an ideal, perfect, normal data set by some clever method. And then I just plot my observations point by point in the increasing order to this one. So if this is more or less normally distributed, my result here should be something like a straight line with s some small deviations. So that's a normal plot. And I might ask you just to explain very briefly what is this about. We have seen in SPSS that you can produce actually tests with formal p-values and stuff for it. But we never looked at the details of those test statistics and so on. Uh, yeah, and then there were this topic here. I just kept it. Uh, we did not go very much into that particular note. I 
just think I talked very briefly about it. Um, so the idea here is basically there are some elaborations in this note, but the idea is that we are working with statistical or mathematical models, and you're doing that all the time in your master courses, more or less, depending on your specialization. But um, any kind of model has to be a simplified description of reality. And when you simplify something, you must ignore something, and then ultimately your model is somewhat false, right? So that's why I say we should always remember that all models are, in some sense, false. There are probably a few too many scientists who, who deal too much with models and then start to believe more in the models than in reality. And if the model says this and reality that, then reality is probably false. So you should maybe change reality and yeah, something like that. So that's what I basically said here. So the idea and the art of making models in science is to have them correct enough. Uh, for instance, a regression model that, that you have seen in the last weeks, it will always be simplifying because it ignores some, some variables that should be there or something. But we also need to have simplicity to be able to work with them. But it needs to be correct enough, meaning that if we want to estimate an elasticity, this could be done without having a perfect description of the, the market that we are studying. But if this comes out as minus 1.3 and we make a confidence interval, of that, it should be reliable in some way. That's what I mean by correct enough here. Um, <coughs> yeah. So this is what we have been doing the, the recent weeks, looking at especially regression models. Uh, and all of them have been simplifications of something. Right. Okay, so I'm guessing maybe it's three o'clock now, but do we really need a break? Because this is not, it's kind of not that hard work, huh? Maybe it's hard to stay awake, but. Uh, in the end of the day. We have like 10 slides left and so maybe 20, 25 minutes we're done. Um, maybe less. So instead of having 15 minutes break and then coming back and going into the night, we'll just quit as soon as we can. Okay, so then we sort of left uh, the foundations and turned to the, the primary goal of the, or this maybe the second primary goal of the course was to deal with regression analysis and to give you a fairly quick and okay introduction to that topic. So I hope we succeeded somewhat in that, that you now realize some of the things that you can do with regression, some of the flexibility that we have, and so on. So we started carefully in lecture four. Chapter four, it's still hanging on this, this because I started wanting to have like uh, 10 or 12 lectures or something. So I started to call it lecture one, lecture two, and so on, but it turned out to be more than one lecture for lecture one. So this year I tried to call it chapter one, but I see that I haven't been consistent, so I need to work more on this. But when I say lecture four, it's really chapter four in the compendium. 
and it's about what we call two variable regression. You have one y variable and one x variable. Um, so this is the linear model. You have your three nice parameters, the constant, the slope, and the standard deviation of this random term. And we have ways of estimating those. And the basic estimation here, we went through that. It's the least squares method. So let me show you just data set with four points. And then we have what we call residuals. So I maybe call them EI. And for these four points, the optimal regression line is the one that minimizes the sum of the squares of these residuals. And this is what we call S. SE, the sum of squares of errors. So that was the start of it. And of course, the estimates, so we get this line with the constant and the slope. And it's both of these numbers are defined by picking the line that minimizes this sum here. And then on the sort of as part of the deal, we get also an estimate for, for the sigma e here. And this is something like, uh, we call it se. And it's very related to this one. It's actually this sum divided by n minus 2, and then the square root of that gives us an estimate for se. So this was that. And there were a few sort of um, outlined basic model assumptions that we need to assume for making this valid. And I'm not going to review those now. Uh, yeah. OK. So that's basic. And then we started to get a little bit more sophisticated in regression because we wanted not only to estimate this line, but we wanted to do inference, which means um, not only look at the estimates, but actually say something about the true parameters. So the true model is this one. But we will never get hold of the true parameters. But we will, with increasing sample size, probably get better and better estimates. So the inference is a question, for instance, the slope. Uh, what can we say about the true slope based on the estimated slope? That's inference. So So the idea then is to consider the whole estimation. You get B1, for instance, estimating estimates beta 1. And the question about precision in an estimate, it depends on the standard deviation of the estimator. So this is very important. We have something called SB1, standard deviation of this estimate. So it means every time we sample from this relationship, we get a different estimate here. But the variance here, or the variation in the results, is described by this standard deviation. So that means we can get confidence intervals for this guy, which we are really interested in, by this formula out there. So it's bi, or say, if you are b1 plus minus t alpha half, and minus 2, and then this standard deviation. And I mean, 
we, in practice, we would use SPSS to just compute this interval for us. And uh, I think I asked some questions in the exam that I just gave you maybe this and this, and asked you to either verify or produce this interval. So then you need to, real to learn where in SPSS do I find these numbers. And you need to realize that, OK, with the sample sizes that we are using, this is going to be very similar to this one. So in when you miss a t-table, you should never be despaired in this course, because it will mean that I'm asking you to approximate with the normal. Then this is confidence intervals. And then in the same sort of approach, we could do some testing for a, a regression coefficient. So basically, um, we can put it like this. Um, OK, let's be specific here. This could be a, a hypothesis test in some regression model or in some regression analysis. How do we do this? Well, you have to look at the estimate here. And it's B1 minus 10. And then divide just by SB1. This is your test statistic. And then just go as usual, I would say, in, in testing. Because if h0 is true, then this would be, this test statistic would be almost standard normal again. OK, with small samples, t distributed, but in our case, standard normal. And you should know what I mean by the standard test in regression. It's simply this here. We discussed this. This is very important. And it's always performed by SPSS. Um, And then the test statistics is the same, just you have 0 here. So it's just B1 over SB1, and still standard normal distribution. This is the standard test. So we did most of the work, sort of, or much of the work in the in chapter four. We did this uh, splitting of variation. Um, yeah. So we looked at the the y variable, the y data. And we had some sort of sum measuring the total variation that we have in our, our dependent variable. So this comes from data, of course. You take your data, your y1, y2, blah, 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 down to yn. And you compute somehow the total variation of that. This is measured by SST. And then we have SSR and our old 
friend SSE, which I showed you here. And we could split the variation in this way, sort of saying that some of this variation is caused by randomness and something is caused by the x variable. And ideally, we want as much as, the, as much as possible to be explained by the x variable. So that's why we define this r square thing as the ratio SSR over SST. It's the r square. So it's less than one and more than zero. Um, This sentence there is not so good. Measures explain why variable variation. Um, it measures how much of the variation in this variable can we actually explain with our model. Right. So close to one is considered better than close to zero. Yeah, and then we did a lot of practical work, which I don't, um, which I won't go into now. But we did, of course, what can we do with SPSS regarding regression analysis? Well, we can do all the practical stuff, and we can read the output. Um, so, just reminding you that you have on Fronter. somewhere the SPSS I showed you this in some lecture that a previous teacher in the course made a detailed uh, explanation of the SPSS regression output right so it's a PDF that you will find on front of um, and I don't know, I don't remember exactly where, but if you don't find it, if you don't, if you haven't found it and you don't find it, send me an email and I will uh, locate it for you. But it should be somewhere logical if I remember correctly. Okay. And then we took up a uh, very nice uh, practical side of the regression. When we deal with predictions, we have this SE estimate. Yeah. And this is very important when it comes to predictions and to measure the, the precision of possible predictions with the model. So you remember this, this uh, short rule. If you want a 95% per percent, uh, margin of error for a pr prediction, we can take just two times this standard deviation. Yeah. This result, by the way, is extremely closely related to what I talked about in the very beginning of the lecture. And we said for a single variable observation data set, this is a 95% um, interval for the data. So it's actually the same underlying principle. We're dealing with the normal distribution and so on in this application. Yep. And then. Uh, this is maybe, this is not particularly for the, well, it could be an exam question, of course, to look at a scatter plot like this and ask, is it a good idea to apply a linear regression model in this case? And 
And the answer is basically no. At least not the model of the kind here. Because the scatter plot, which is usually the first thing we should look at, um, shows a clear nonlinear structure here. So our model, which would be this one, would in this case be two false for making predictions, for instance. Uh, you see that for lower or higher x values, the data seem to be over the line, while in the mid-range, the data is mostly under the line. So if you use the linear thing here to predict, you are missing in in all parts of the data range. But it could, of course, be that you might save a lot by just adding a second order term here. And this is something we know how to handle, right? By chapter six. It's a nonlinear thing, but we can put it in here and make it linear in a way with two variables. Yeah, so there was a qu very quick note in the end of lecture four. Um, when you use a regression in SPSS, you can produce, you can look at the residuals, and they are supposed to be normal. And you can produce what's called a normal plot of the residuals to check this. So this is one important place where we use this normal plot actually to to assert that our analysis is is healthy in a way. Okay. So then we. We continue. Now you realize that uh, we have three chapters left in the course, but I have only three slides left. So very much of the work was actually done in chapter four. And then we just, just saw that we could rely a lot on that later on. So we started in, in chapter five with the multiple regression allowing several x variables simultaneously, still doing a linear model. Same estimation principle with the least squares method. Um, yeah, SPSS output is basically the same. It just has one line for each x variable. And you get this standard test for each of each of these null hypotheses. So you test for each coefficient. Is it zero? Is it not zero? And you just want to have variables where this coefficient is appearing to be non-zero. Yeah. So the main complication that comes up when we deal with multiple regression in a linear fashion is that there may be some correlation between these x variables. So it's always a little bit shaky and difficult to make interpretations when these x variables are correlated. And it was also necessary to add one additional model assumptions. That means simply that there shouldn't be a 100% correlation between any of these x variables. And there was a fairly complicated, or I had an example why that was necessary, which I don't know how you appreciate it, but at least what happens is that if you add very correlated variables, 100% correlated variables, it's impossible to estimate parameters by this method.
Yeah. So inference is basically the same. Um, and for us in, yeah, we said that we use t distributions with n minus two degrees of freedom when uh, we had one x variable. Now we use n minus k minus one, but really it doesn't matter for us since we're going to use standard normal anyway. Um, and you have seen that SPS is, if we want to, it will do, it will produce confidence intervals for all the coefficients and does the standard tests. And if we want to make a m special test, which means say beta three equal seven versus beta three not equal seven, that's not the standard test, so I call it a special test. Then we need to do it manually, which means we need to compute this test statistic. So it's the same as I showed you here 13 minutes ago. Use this and use standard normal distribution if n if the sample size is not too small. Yeah. So that what that's what it means. Special test done manually. You have to find this estimate in the SPSS output, find the standard deviation, take this, subtract seven, divide by this, and see whether it's critical compared to a standard normal distribution. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming close. Um, So we talked a little bit about model building. Um, quite often we have some theory, economic theory for instance, saying that okay, prices and demand should work together in some way. And then we try to put up a mathematical model of that. Um, so that's theory. And then we have sample data, which hopefully makes it possible to estimate a model and then we can see some variables could be significant, some could not be significant. And then we are building a model for this uh, relation. So basically in our final model, we normally want to include only variables that are significant in the sense that they, they explain some of the variation in our dependent variable. So, Usually, we, we, at least for prediction models, we would say that it requires requires a high R square. So it's, I mean, it's always good with a high R square. But it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, that you have a low R square. It might be unavoidable in some senses, in some situations, that your R square is quite low. So if you're analyzing a market, you might not want to exactly uh, predict the demand, but you might want to be interested in the elasticity of some price, for instance, and, and elasticity estimate can be good, even if R square is low. So it's a fairly common misunderstanding that to say if R square is 0.25, oh no, this model is horrible. Look at the low R square. This is not a valid statement at all. 
it might be that we are primarily interested in estimated coefficients or just asserting the significance of some some x variables and then the r square is not really that interesting for us So here's a pretty heavy slide. It, it uh, comprises lecture six and seven, but this is how we uh, kind of sort of really took off in a way because this this lifts the whole regression analysis from doing okay we can do linear stuff, but that seems very limited in a way and then we see in chapter six and seven that a lot more general models can be transformed in fairly simple ways so that we are able to sort of estimate coefficients in a very many different types of models and everything boils in the end down to using linear regression actually so This is sort of my favorite, probably part of the course is, is maybe lecture six and seven in, in a way. And that does not mean I'm gonna take all questions this year from these two chapters, but uh, maybe a few. They tend to be difficult questions, of course. As you see in the end of the two previous exams, there are some challenges regarding this here. But clearly, a, an exam in a master course should have challenges for it. Not only challenges, but some. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more of that on the next slide. But um, just make this briefly. We looked at three different forms of nonlinearities. The first one was where we have like x square or products of variables and so on, that these are non-linearities and we solve them very simply by just renaming this and this as a new variable and making a bigger set of variables and then using a linear regression again. Uh, the second thing was when we had categorical variables in our data and this was solved fairly elegantly with indicator or dummy variables. So like we did in the flat price example, we choose one reference market and then we have indicator variables for the others and we can estimate uh, corrections to the price level, for instance. And finally, we had what we call exponential models and power models, um, which was only possible to solve by using this logarithmic transformation. And then it turns out the relation becomes linear with logarithms of prices and logarithms of demands and so on. Um, So what, what we have seen, we, we can do, in all of these cases, we can sort of transform our variables in some ways, and then we end with some linear regression, and then the whole machinery uh, that we had from chapter four and five can be applied, so we can come to these confidence intervals directly from that. So there's nothing new really into this, uh, into the statistics actually. So most of this is mathematics in a way. Just ma making sure that the new thing is linear. So we have seen in exercises that we can provide confidence intervals for price elasticities and even seasonal demand effects and so on.
yeah so i guess that wraps up the thing so let me fin finish the thing by saying a little bit about the exam um, so it's going to be something like 12 to 16 single questions which are labeled 1a 1b and so on and all of these are going to be given the same weight when we are grading them. So that might seem strange for some of you, but even if you have a very simple 1A and a very complicated 5C, I'm going to put the same weight on them in the final grading. So there's going to be a fair amount of standard questions. So my aim is sort of that any student who has worked reasonably well with the course should be sort of in no danger of failing or anything like that and then I need a few more challenging uh, questions because I also don't want everyone to have an A basically <laughs> so it's this balance that is a bit difficult but I usually come out fairly well with that um, yeah so this, this uh, equal weight here, it has a consequence. It, it means you should try to do all things that are easy for you first. Right. So it might be you know, 1A, 1B, maybe 1C turns out to be very difficult. And then 2A, B, C, D, E, 3A, B, C, 4A, B, C. So for most of you, it will probably be not too much time on an exam. It's four hours, and you have to do some quick, some work there. So if you do this OK, and this OK, and this turn out to be difficult, just leave it. Don't spend more than 10 minutes to make sure that it's very difficult, at least. Uh, <laughs> don't spend 45 minutes and then realize, oh, this is a bit difficult. So <laughs> because you're not going to get any more paid by doing this than doing that, which might take you three minutes. And this, you might do this very well and this very well. But if you spend uh, one hour here, you might not have even time to look at this one. So this is what you should avoid to spend a lot of time on something that is potentially difficult here and then not having time to look at everything. Yeah, you can bring anything on paper to the exam. You cannot bring, yeah, I mean, you have to follow the rules and regulations, of course. No cell phones and stuff. But a calculator, of course, you, you should bring. Um, yeah, so here are the example questions plus the previous exams and solutions, I hope. If not, you email me and I'll put solutions there. And then here is the grading procedure basically outlined. It's supposing you have n uh, questions of this type, 1a, 1b, and so on. I score each of them from 0 to 10 points. And then you can maximally score 10 times n if everything is perfect. But at least all of you will score less than or equal to the m. Yep. Mm. Uh, we answered right, but we still got like 80% because we didn't formulate the answer like perfectly. I don't know. Oh. The well. The is not mm. enough, right? Well, uh, it's very difficult to answer that in a. But uh, frankly, it wasn't me who put those 80% there either, so. Okay. So. What's your expectation? No, you, I, if you have the right numbers there, and if it's not asked specifically for an explanation, it's uh, it should be a full score with the with the numbers. Right? Um, 
Yeah. And if there is a problem and uh, difficulty in the calculating something and mm. something wrong happened in the calculation. Yeah. So you will uh, cut the whole marks or you will No, that's that's also one No, one thing. So it's very easy as I have done several times myself to miscalculate stuff and so on. You make a sign wrong and so on and usually uh, if the procedure, for instance, is outlined correctly and and uh, you happen to make a mistake, it's usually not pen punished at all. It might be if it happens on every question that you do something like that, uh, then I will withdraw something for <laughs> general uh, sloppiness. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the stress of an exam is particularly prone to create such mistakes. Yeah, so the idea here is that you, you, you score something and then you, we compute the percentage of maximum score, more or less straight. And then we have some very fixed limits that allows us to convert this percentage into to a, a letter grade. And it's these numbers here. So you have to come up to 35 to get to the passing mark and then it just increases like this. So an A is from 92 and upwards, B is from 78 to 91 and so on. So well there, there's, there isn't much you can do about these things. Um, there's usually some or happens that some student get 91 um, and it's tempting to put an A, but then there's another one who get 90. So why should this on 91 have an A and this on 90 have a B? So we just have to put this line somewhere and we try to be fairly strict on that. Of course, if you're on the limit, we will check more precisely that we did the proper scoring, but um, a system with letter grades sort of implies that someone always have to be have a very strong B grade, which is still a B. And then there's a very weak A, and that those two uh, exams will be very similar. There's nothing we can do about that. Right. Okay, so I'll stop there and just invite you, if you have questions, to come to my office or come to Vladimir and uh, the exam is about 12th of December, I think. Uh, will there be a seminar on uh, Thursday? No. No? No more lab. No. <laughs>